Hello and welcome to Inventing Civilization, the YouTube channel where we take a closer look at the history of political thought and philosophy. In this episode, Abu Nasr al-Farabi. Last we spoke, we found ourselves in ancient Rome, but we're going to skip ahead a few centuries here as Europe descended into its Dark Ages and we turn our eyes instead to the Middle East, more specifically the Islamic Golden Age of the 9th and 10th centuries. At this point in history, when Europe had managed to destroy itself in a lengthy fit of barbarism, civilization was to be found in the Middle East, where every self-respecting city had a library and philosophy thrived. It was the Prophet Muhammad himself who said knowledge should be sought everywhere, even as far as China, and there was a very rich tradition of young men travelling the empire, if not the world, in search of learning. It was that educational environment that nurtured Abu Nasr al-Farabi, who himself is known to have travelled throughout the Islamic world. But he appears to have spent most of his adult life in Baghdad, the absolute centre of learning at the time. And it was in Baghdad where al-Farabi would write most of his works. While ancient Greek thought, once so revered by the Romans, was being smothered by Christianity in Europe, the Islamic world continued to study Greek philosophy. Indeed, Islamic philosophers would come to refer to al-Farabi as the second teacher, after none other than Aristotle, whom they refer to as the first teacher. Al-Farabi's views on politics and the state harbour a lot of similarities to the works of both Plato and Aristotle, with of course the necessary diversions to make them fit for the Islamic world. Al-Farabi was the most prolific political philosopher of his time. While most Islamic scholars concerned themselves with religious philosophy, Al-Farabi brought attention to political philosophy. The two main treatises he wrote on the subject of politics are The Virtuous City, Ara Ahl al Medina al Fadila, and The Civil Polity, Kitab al Siyasa al Medinia. A central concept to Al Farabi's views on politics is Sa'ada, what the ancient Greeks called eidamonia, or in modern English, happiness. Al Farabi thought the purpose of humans, as the only rational creatures in the universe, was to seek truth, which, once found, would lead to supreme happiness, Sa'ada. Al Farabi thought Sa'ada was the ultimate goal in life, and it could only be achieved through living a virtuous and contemplating existence in the image of God. If Sa'ada was the purpose of life, it naturally followed that the political regime of the state should serve that purpose. A virtuous regime, in other words, that would allow people to work together to live noble and virtuous lives so that they might achieve Sa'ada, happiness. Al Farabi's ideal regime, which he called the virtuous state, is fundamentally hierarchic. He bases this on his views of the human body, where all the organs have to work together in their appropriate functions. The heart is the master organ, followed by the brain as the secondary organ, and so on and so forth. So, all the way at the top of this hierarchic system would be one supreme ruler, who had achieved intellectual perfection, and who would therefore be on the receiving end of divine revelation. Now, this supreme leader would be the source of all power and knowledge in the state. He leads the state and puts everyone else in their rightful stations. He is then essentially a philosopher prophet, who rules the virtuous state as God rules the universe. Now, of course, such a state did not exist, so Al Farabi went on to describe how different states were falling short of this ideal. States can be ignorant, meaning the citizens simply are not aware of divine happiness and spend their time trying to achieve lower ends instead. States can also be immoral, meaning citizens do understand divine happiness but consciously choose not to pursue it. And states can be erring, meaning the citizens have either misunderstood divine happiness or have been led astray. Like the citizens of the ignorant states, they too are striving to achieve lower ends. What all of these states have in common is that they've lost sight of Sa'ada one way or another. The pursuit of lower ends, as in the non-virtuous states, leads to different kinds of regimes depending on which ends are pursued, according to Al Farabi. He identifies six. The state of necessities, where citizens pursue only the bare necessities of life, 
the vile state where citizens pursue wealth for its own sake, the base state where citizens pursue only sensory pleasures, the timocratic state where citizens pursue honor and glory, the despotic state where citizens pursue power and the subjugation of others, and finally the democratic state where citizens pursue the freedom to do as they please. El Farabi holds that of these six non-virtuous states, the timocratic state, the state of necessities and the democratic state hold the most promise. The timocratic state has the greatest potential. After all, its citizens pursue honor, which is at least laudable, if besides the point. But that does make it relatively likely that good people end up in positions of leadership. In the state of necessities, the citizens are not yet corrupted by such things as money, pride or power. So they could still be led down the path of virtue towards Sa'ada, although obviously they have quite a long way to go. For the democratic state, the situation is a little bit trickier. See, the democratic state, after all, is essentially a blend of all the other states. Some citizens, the poor, will find themselves struggling to survive as the citizens in the state of necessities. Others will occupy their days chasing wealth, glory or power. The great appeal of democracy is its freedom to do as you please which means it attracts people from outside and creates a state of incredible diversity. And that's key because some of the people in the democratic state will be virtuous. They will be philosophers and orators and poets who understand Sa'ada and who will use their skills to spread the message of Sa'ada and the virtuous path towards it. So in other words, if the majority of the people in a democratic state come to embrace Sa'ada as the ultimate goal in life, the democratic state can become a virtuous state, or at least as close as you can get to it on earth. El Farabi was a lot more positive about democracy than Plato ever was, and his thought inspires a great deal of interesting questions about how Islam itself may be compatible with the idea of democracy. Now, El Farabi conceded that his virtuous state was a virtually unattainable ideal, and he offered some concessions. For example, if the no less than 12 characteristics El Farabi identified as constituting a virtuous leader don't exist in any one single individual, the state could perhaps be ruled by a group of individuals who collectively possess these characteristics. But in truth, none of his concessions really make the virtuous state a great deal likelier to come into existence. So, if El Farabi didn't provide us with a workable model for a state, what then is the value of his teachings? Well, there are a number of reasons why El Farabi matters. For one, he managed to bring political philosophy into a society dominated by a revealed religion. It's important to understand this is no small feat. The two are not easily compatible. El Farabi argued that revelation was actually inferior to reason because it is, after all, much easier to receive a message than it is to reason your own way to the same truth. And anyway, you need reason to interpret a revelation. This implied, for one, that the Prophet Muhammad himself was a philosopher as well, an idea that validated philosophy in Islamic culture. It also proved the necessity for education. The entire structure of El Farabi's virtuous state is geared towards it, with the most learned people in charge guiding those of lesser intellectual capacity in their lower stations. So, the notion El Farabi put forth that we should look to both ancient philosophy and holy scripture and then use our rational intellect to move forward was very different from the much more primitive idea that dominated Europe at the time, where everybody should just listen to the Pope who got his intel straight from God. So, when it comes to El Farabi, it isn't so much that his discussion of different types of states was new. It wasn't. It's that he brought back ideas from an ancient era and updated them so that they were suitable for an entirely new world, one that was dominated by Abrahamic religions. This not only kept ancient political philosophy alive, it also ensured that ancient thought and Islamic thought would find their way to Europe, where they would profoundly influence Renaissance thinkers. El Farabi was unique in placing the emphasis on political philosophy. To El Farabi, the entire discipline of philosophy itself revolved around political philosophy, without which it was a useless exercise. And nobody in the 10 centuries that separated El Farabi from Kikero had thought of that. So you could say that El Farabi put politics back 
on the roster. Well, that concludes this episode. I hope you've enjoyed it. As always, if you'd like to learn more or cite this video, check the description box below for more information. For now, though, I want to thank you very much for watching. See you next time. Goodbye.